Discrete calculus can be sometimes frustrating, but there's one small definition that simplifies things greatly. It's not the most intuitive thing that you've ever seen, but it is worth taking a little bit of time and going over. This is something called falling powers notation. And here is the slightly unmotivated definition. For k, a positive integer, let's define n to the falling k to be the following. We're going to denote it n with a superscript k, but that k has an underline. That's very important. n to the falling k is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 all the way up through n minus k plus 1. That is, I have k of these terms. You could say that a little bit more compactly by saying that it's n factorial divided by n minus k factorial. Okay, now why do we do this? Well, it's not so clear at first, but here's a hint. Try to prove that there's a relationship between falling powers and the binomial coefficients. That is, try to show that n choose k is really n to the falling k over k factorial. And that's a hint as to why this is so important and so useful. Now, this definition has a lot of flexibility to it. n doesn't necessarily have to be an integer. We could also say that if k is equal to 0, we're just going to declare n to the falling 0 to be 1 because n choose 0 is always 1 in the same way that 0 factorial is best when you just declare it to be 1. Okay, let's look at a few examples of sequences defined using falling powers. So, for example, if we look at the sequence n to the falling 2, what is that? Well, that's 0 to the falling 2, 1 to the falling 2, 2 to the falling 2, etc., etc. That keeps on going. If you work out what those numerical values are, well, 0 to the falling 2 is going to be just 0, right? It's 0 times negative 1. And 1 to the falling 2 is going to be 1 times 0. That's also 0. 2 to the falling 2 is 2 times 1. OK, that's going to be non-zero. That's 2. And then you could keep going. You get 6, 12, 20. The nth term in that sequence is n times n minus 1. OK, for another example, n to the falling 3. The individual terms of that are going to be 0 to the falling 3, 1 to the falling 3, 2 to the falling 3. The nth term in that sequence is n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. Now, because of that, the first three terms in this sequence vanish, and the first non-zero term is going to be 3 to the falling 3, that is 6, or 3 factorial. In general, n to the falling k is going to be a sequence where the first k terms vanish, and the next term is equal to k factorial. And you might have some fun working that out in generality. OK, but uh, so what? I mean, why are we doing this? Why bother with this kind of weird notation? Well, we have observed that you can make sense of derivatives and integrals in discrete calculus, but they never quite work, do they? Think about it. What is the derivative of n squared? It should be 2n. But the discrete derivative, the forward difference of n squared, is, as we have shown, the sequence 2n plus 1. It's, it's just off by a little bit. So close, but it's off. Or if we turn to integrals, we've seen from the fundamental theorem that the integral from a to b of the derivative of x should be what? Well, it should be x evaluated from a to b. But the sum, as n goes from a to b, of delta xn is really x at b plus 1 minus x at a. That one evaluation point is just off by 1. If we make this a little bit more concrete, if we take the sum as n goes from 0 to capital M of n, or if you like, n to the 1, what should the integral of n to the 1 be? Well, it should be, I don't know, 1 half n squared evaluated from 0 to m. Mm, we get so close. It is, in fact, 1 half m squared minus 1 half m. It's just a little bit off. Discrete calculus almost works the way that continuous calculus does. How do you fix that? Falling powers is how you fix that. 
We're not going to go too far down this road, but let's do one fairly straightforward lemma to see how nice things work with falling powers. Here's the result. The forward difference of n to the falling k is what you think it should be. It's k times n to the falling k minus 1. Now, the proof of this is direct. There's no tricks, but it is kind of complicated symbolically. So stick with me as we work through this. What's the forward difference of n to the falling k? By definition of the forward difference, it's n plus 1 to the falling k minus n to the falling k. Now we're going to use the definition of falling powers. n plus 1 to the falling k is n plus 1 factorial divided by n plus 1 minus k factorial. And n to the falling k is n factorial divided by n minus k factorial. I'm going to look at the difference between those two. And yes, you guessed it. <laughs> it's fraction time. We need to put this over a common denominator. What is that common denominator? It's going to be quantity n plus 1 minus k factorial. So that's my denominator. Up top, what I have is an n factorial in each numerator. And then what's left over in the first term is quantity n plus 1. And then on the right, what I have to do to get it over that common denominator is put in a factor of quantity n plus 1 minus k. So what I have in the end after I factored that out is n factorial divided by n plus 1 minus k factorial times quantity n plus 1 minus quantity n plus 1 minus k. A little bit of simplification gives me k times n factorial all divided by n minus quantity k minus 1 end parenthesis factorial. That then gives me k, factoring that out, times n to the falling k minus 1 by definition of falling powers. And that's it. That's the result that we were looking for. Now, that's kind of complicated, but it's just a hint of what you can do to use falling powers to make discrete calculus make sense. You can do a lot more with falling powers. But look, if you found this confusing, don't worry about it. This is more curious than crucial. Focus your energies on Taylor expansion of smooth functions. That's the thing from calculus we're going to use the most. But if you're curious as to what you can do with discrete calculus, keep watching.